Amen. And as always, beautiful worship. The gentleman that was playing the, what is this called, Pastor T? What is what, The who? Cajon. The Cajon. The gentleman playing the Cajon. That's got to be a young person's ministry because my back would be tearing me up right about now. But he did so phenomenal. All of you did phenomenal. Lord Jesus. I said, he must have been a patty cake mask as a kid. That was good. <laughs> For those who do not know me, my name is Reginald Burrell. I am a friend of Aaron, and I'm happy that I get to call him my friend. Not just somebody he calls to come preach for him when he needs a break here and here and there. Because I know he needs a break here and there. <laughs> I will do what I'm supposed to do. I will do my responsibility. I will not be before you long. I will do the best I can for you all to enjoy this wonderful, hot day. Amen. Yes, Lord. <laughs> um, I have with me my beautiful wife of nine years. Been together longer than that. But it took a while for you to say you marry me. I have my lovely daughter here, Anaya. Okay, I have my mother-in-law here with me as well. If I had a, uh, a, a, a ministry or something to where I needed the president of the committee, she wouldn't let anybody else be it. It would have to be her. <laughs> and then my son is here also, but he's with all the other children, so uh, I hope he doesn't contaminate Children's Church with his crazy behavior. Uh, he gets it from his mother. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. My responsibility this morning is to speak to you and talk to you from the book of Psalms chapter 68. Psalms chapter 68. Now I'm weird, I do things a little bit different, so if you want to make me feel at home, if you could, turn to Psalm 68, and once you get to Psalm 68, if you could, let us stand together for this reading. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. After I read 1 through 10, I would love to pray with you, and then you may be seated for the rest of the evening. Somebody say, why you got us standing? I try and get you to stand so it slows you down from going to sleep on me. At least you got to wait until you sit back down before you go. <laughs> I'll be reading this from the New King James Version. It's not that this is better. This is just what I study from. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those also who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive away them. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad, let them rejoice before God, yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah. And rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of the widows, is God in his holy habitation. Verse number six. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, see lie. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God and the God of Israel. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain whereby you confirmed your inheritance and your glory. Your congregation was in it. You, O oh God, provide for your goodness for your glory. If I was to give a title or subject that I would like to talk to everyone about, that's my dad. Good Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your peace, your patience, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you for being who you are, because if one of us had to switch places and you became us and you became you, we would bless this and we would be praying. We thank you for knowing how to handle us in all of our random ways and our weird moments and our crazy idiosyncrasies, whatever the thing that is about us, we thank you for knowing how to deal with it. Most of all, we thank you for knowing you know how to deal with it. Thank you. 
seats. Amen. 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 It's Father's Day, so of course I have to be a little focused on that. Give us that a moment. You know, it's not as glorifying as Mother's Day, I know. It's not as important as Christmas, and it's definitely not as important as Black Friday. The sisters know how to get up for Black Friday and do some shopping. Bless your heart. But, but, but being a father, something that I've learned that I've had to make sure I pay attention to is the relevance of my name. The relevance of my name. And, and, and it's not that I have the biggest, greatest name as of yet. Hopefully, Lord's willing, one day I will because I want my children to be able to say, you know who my daddy is. That's my daddy. So oftentimes, what I try to do with my children is I try and tell them certain things that stand out and I hope that they remember. And one of the things that I spoke to my daughter before she entered high school was these words. You're going to this school and it's a little bit higher up. One thing I need you to do is don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. You are not everybody else in this school. You are not like anybody else in this school. You are one of a kind. You are an individual. And most importantly, you're not theirs, but you are mine. Don't forget who you are. But oftentimes, sometimes we forget that. We forget who we are sometimes. We struggle with who we are sometimes. Because there are these stages and ages that every single one of us go through. And what many don't know is, while we may have gotten there, we're still trying to figure it out. It's not defined as to what it is. It's not defined at all. And, and, and what I love about what God allows me to do is, he allows me to force myself to be refocused, refreshed, and renewed. And it doesn't always feel good because when I was 21, I did things totally different than what I did at 30. But if you get so caught in the one word of being grown and adult, you'll get confused about your growth and development. And so right here in this text, we're trying to figure out why is David saying all of this stuff? Why is David speaking so highly about God and who he is? And why is David so, so focused on letting it be known that if you hate God, I hope God gets rid of you? Why is he so adamant about this? And I realize the reason why David is adamant is because David is saying, that's my daddy. Now, now, it seems obvious and easy that David would say, that's my dad, because all of us, God is the supreme. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the God of all gods. There is nothing before him. There's nothing coming after him. He looked in front of him. There was nothing. And he looked behind him, and there was absolutely nothing. From forever to forever, I am God. So it's obvious and easy to see him on a higher level, on a higher plateau. But then I learned there's a specific reason as to why David would have said what he said about everything he says about God. One thing that all of us know, you may not know Psalm 68, but you know 23rd Psalms. And the first few words say what? The Lord is my shepherd. We know that. That's something that we all have heard of that David said. But then I had to keep reading my Bible a little bit more, and I believe it says, I know I have to write it down. I believe it's Psalms 51 and 5, where it says something along the lines of, In iniquity did my mother conceive me, and in sin, see, I got to make sure I get it right, because that's how it's too good to mess it up. Way too good to mess it up. I got to go down. Yes, okay, Psalms 51 and 5, it says, Behold, I will walk forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And then verse 6 it says, Behold, you desire truth in your inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. When David said that, I was kind of confused for a moment. But then I read it again and it says, In iniquity did my mother conceive me. Almost as if to say, Mama's baby, Papa's baby. Why would you say that, Reggie? I say that because when Samuel, one of the greatest prophets, came down to speak with David, uh, 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 or speak with Jesse, rather, Jesse the Bethlehemite, he called all his sons into the house except for David. Now, let's be real. Which one of us have multiple siblings? Raise your hand if you have multiple siblings. Now, let's just say, for instance, that mama and daddy called everybody in but you. And it's supposed to be a glorifying moment, a highlight. It's supposed to be a moment where you're excited and you're full of joy because somebody great is coming, somebody of, 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 of respect, somebody important, rather it be a president or, or a senator, somebody that you look up to highly, and he says, okay, we're going to go in, but you stay outside with the sheep. 
And the funny thing is, we, don't, we never hear anywhere in text how David had an attitude about it. We hear nowhere in text where David was upset possibly about him not being called into the room that night. And when he was called into the room and he was chosen that night, I have a feeling that after they poured the oil over his head, he probably said something along the lines of, can I go back outside now? David is always celebrating and glorifying God, and he's saying, that's my dad. But let's look at some things that dad has done over the years, because we all know that there's moments that we get mad at dad. Our dad, God, God was on the time he made his, his first son that we talk about in the book of Genesis. His name was Adam. And, and he told Adam everything that he was supposed to do. Fathers, don't you hate when you are letting your children know what they're supposed to do? And right after you just told them what to do, they do the complete opposite of what you said. Almost as if they meant to do the complete opposite of what you said. Yeah, yeah. Adam is told every single thing he's supposed to do. He's told how to handle the garden, what he needs to do, what he should not do. And the only thing God said was, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else you can have. All of this stuff I've made and given you, and you can have all of it, but this one thing you cannot touch. And Adam got a friend that he had hanging out with him. And that friend was like, ooh, Adam, don't this look good? <laughs> Adam, like, oh, well, what are you supposed to eat or whatever? And she's listening, talking to somebody else who slithered his way into the garden. And she ends up eating a piece of the fruit of the tree that he said, don't touch. And then she takes it over and gives it to Adam. See, this is one thing I will say. I'm not trying to beat this up, but this is our day. But this is the weird thing that many people do. They make it seem as if Adam was in Georgia and Eve was in LA. And she packed up the fruit and got on a plane and flew back to Adam and said, hey, look what I got when I was out in L.A. I don't see it that way. I see them right there being reasonably close together, and lo and behold, Adam didn't do what his dad said do, and guess what his dad did? His dad kicked him out the house. But we were just celebrating God, and Adam and David is celebrating God, but, but God kicked his first son out of the house. Huh. God, God knows about this other situation with this guy named Jacob and, and God is, well no, he talks to Abraham first before he talks to that. He talks to Abraham and, and he tells Abraham at the age of 72 because Abraham was living with his dad for a very long time. 72. He was with his dad and he had all of his kids and yeah, I don't want to live with my parents until 72. Matter of fact, I'm happy I don't live with them right now. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh Lord. But he told him at 72, leave the land of Ur, and I'll send you to a land. Now, I'm supposed to be mentioning this word, Abba. Abba is typically known as a Jewish word, but I want to help you out. It's actually a Gentile word, word rather. I know, I love that expression. Thank you. I'm like, what? Shut your mouth. <laughs> It's actually a Gentile word. The reason it's a Gentile word is because the Jewish nation did not come about until Abraham had his first child. Abraham created the Jewish nation that we know of today. It was not a nation prior to. That's why we can say God likes coffee. Well, how do you know God likes coffee? Because Abraham is Hebrew. <laughs> that was supposed to go off way better than that, but it's okay. <laughs> but it's, it's I, I simply means father. I was trying to listen to Aaron, and he had all the good ones. What you have, Elo, Elohim? Uh, was it Yahweh? Was that Apple? Elohim and Yahweh? And I'm like, you, you picked the good ones. You gave me the one that just means father. <laughs> I'm trying to look for something real good and knock him out the park where he gives me Abba. Okay. But it, it, it really does mean father. Father. But the, the, the reason I love he gave it to me is because being a father, sometimes we are the most confusing people in the world. And that's what we have to keep looking at what God did. He calls Abraham out at 72, and at 72, he tells him, <clears throat> you're going to have a baby. <laughs> now, 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 grandparents, I'm pretty sure the highlight of having grandchildren is you get them, you spoil them, and you send them back home. <laughs> right? Well, Abraham wasn't thinking about having to keep them, spoil them, and they're not going nowhere. 
He tells him at 72 that you're going to be a father of many nations, and he didn't believe it. Make it worse, it didn't happen at 72, it happened at 99. And you figure, God, you're the father, you know this man wanted children. Why is it you step into his life at this strange time? And right when he got comfortable with never being able to have children, him and his wife, why is it that you change everything? Aren't you supposed to be a good, good father? You know what we've been working for. You know what we've been striving to do. You know the, the, the bills that we're trying to do everything we can. We're working as hard as we can, but for some odd reason, I don't have enough to pay the light bill. I've been trying to be everything that I can to my wife, but for some odd reason, she's not happy or satisfied with me. I've been trying to be great to this man, but for some odd reason, he's not satisfied or happy with me. I've been trying to be good at this job, and for some odd reason, they don't like me, they don't want me. God, if you're a good, good father, why don't you help me out in the moment that I need you? Because for some odd reason, you show up at the most strangest times. And he shows up and makes Abraham a father at 99. Hmm. And of course, Jacob, 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 yeah. Jacob, Jacob is, is one of the further down sons uh, in the same lineage with Abraham. And Jacob is wanting to be with this woman named Rachel. And he wanted Rachel so bad that he was willing to work seven years to get her. Now that is amazing because many of these young men today won't work seven days to get a young woman. <laughs> See you <love. laughs> He worked seven years and after he got done working seven years, the father who had his own tradition tricked him in the middle of the night and said, all right, there you go, and sent in another woman and they consummated the relationship. And he woke up the next morning and said, you are not who I thought you were supposed to be. Now, 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 I know the woman like, he should have known because you know she is and, and you know that wasn't her. They didn't have night lights like we did do today, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't plug it in the wall and clap on. <laughs> They're like, That's, you're not Rachel, you Leah. Get out of here. Go get Rachel. They, it was different. Somebody like, no, nah, I got to read the Bible for myself to make sure, because he should have had, a, you know, the Bible say, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. He ain't had no light on his feet to check. You know, not that night. He didn't. He didn't have it with him, I guess. I don't know. But he had, he didn't get Rachel, he got Leah. And what makes it worse is Leah wanted to be loved. She ended up having child after child after child. The first four, she, she had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, and was excited, especially when you, you birthing out boys in this time. They were greatly excited. And then when he finally got Rachel after working another seven years, 14 years in total, this woman wasn't able to bear children. And God, if you love me so much, why wouldn't you take care of the fact that this is the woman I wanted to be with but you won't even open up her womb so that we can show a product of our love? Hmm. She finally has this child, Joseph. And of all the 12 children, at this moment, 11 to a certain point, until she finally gave birth to Benjamin and then years later, because she died on the wagon going, that was another story. <laughs> but she passed away, and she gave birth to Benjamin. But Joseph, out of all the children, since he was the firstborn to the one he loved, Rachel, he made him a coat. He showed favoritism. Now, one thing I've learned of in being a parent, me and my wife both love our children, but we love them differently. It's not that one loves them more or less. It's different. It's different for all the right reasons, rather we understand it or not. And in most cases, it's different for boys with their moms than it is for boys with their dads. See, boys generally will go and run to mom, while the girls will typically run to dad. Why? Because dad is hard on the boy and mom is hard on the girl. Why does that make the most sense? Because in that boy, there is a reflection. There is a, a reflection. He is what I used to be. I am what he will become. And oftentimes we need the lesson. She is what you used to be, and you are what she will become. And oftentimes you need the lesson. But it's a hard lesson to learn often, and you got to do a fight that you never thought of with your children. And Jacob had to deal with a fight with his children because they sold his favorite son. But God, if you love me so much, you wouldn't have let anything happen to my baby. Aren't you a good, good father? 
I said that us as fathers are often a strange being. It's not that we mean to be mean. It's not that we mean to not show emotion. It's not that we mean to be disconnected. It's not that we mean to, to act as if we don't care. What you have to get is what women do easily, men do difficultly. You will talk about any and everything with anybody. You tell it, look, I love it. My mother-in-law will have a conversation with a complete stranger by the time the both of them get done. Somehow she got information about them and they didn't got information about her. I would never do that. <laughs> it's a difference. We often are reserved for many different reasons because of the order of the family. What do you mean, Rachel, the order of the family? The order of the family is the kids typically can run to mom. And mom, if the relationship is right, can run to dad. But oftentimes, who does dad have to run to? Because if dad turned around and ran back to mom, oh, if he's that concerned, that means all hell might be breaking loose. And depending on the situation, if you're known to be the strong one, fellas, the last thing that everybody else around you can handle is you breaking down. When my family found out I was diabetic, everybody thought the world was crumbling because since Superman finally has met kryptonite. I said, it's okay, I just gotta take a pill every day, it's all right. I just gotta change what I eat, it's okay. Well, you, you okay, you need this? My mother-in-law almost beat up my wife this morning making sure I got a sandwich for, to take my medicine. <laughs> because when you're known to be the focal point and the strong one, and something happens to you, people get concerned. They get concerned, they get worried. Jacob is concerned and worried because his only boy not his only boy, the boy that he loved the most. It, it was from the one that he loved the most, whom, whom his heart was for, who no longer is here, and, and, and he is the last piece of that love, and, and now he's missing, and God, if you're a good guy, why did you let that happen? Hmm. Honestly, I didn't come here to talk to you about any of that. I really didn't. I really came to talk to you about verses 9 and 10 of Psalm 68. What does it say, Reggie? I'm glad you asked. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain whereby you confirmed your inheritance when it was weary. Your congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided from your goodness for the poor. Well, what is that supposed to mean? Ah, that's a really good question. I was looking through and studying and examining and trying to figure out what could David be talking about with this plentiful rain because it's been a lot of times in the Bible that it's rained. When I was going through, I found 22 different verses that spoke about water either being given or withheld. 22. Out of the 22, the last one that I was looking at made the most sense to me for this statement on why we all should be happy. Even though it seems strange, even though it seems weird, even though it seems difficult dealing with God, because he doesn't answer when you want him to. You may ask him a question, but for some odd reason, you don't get a verbal response. Make matters worse sometimes, you say a certain kind of prayer, and you're praying and praying and praying, but for some odd reason, your God's answer doesn't look like your prayer request. It gets frustrating at times because you're asking God to give you a tree, and he sends you an acorn. The acorn can become the tree, but I was expecting to get the tree. He's saying, I don't give you those kinds of things. I give you things that you have to care for, that you have to cultivate, that you have to work with, that you have to grind for. Because the one thing that us as dads have to deal with, mom is going to get her flowers while she's here. Dad's our best friend has to be delayed gratification. So what text was I looking at that said a lot of things to me about why he's speaking about plentiful with rain? I looked at Noah. And Noah, you know, had to build that big old boat called an ark about four football fields long and about a football, and a half, football field and a half high up. Noah was 120 when he had to make this boat. Noah's youngest son was 92. I, we don't have to do a Genesis study yet. It's real strange. It, no, 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 no. He, forgive me, he was 500. But it took him 120 years to actually build the boat. Forgive me. And his youngest son was 92. But when I was looking at everything in there, the only thing that mattered to me was when I got to the part that said that when everything happened, they were on the boat, and the water started to come, God closed the door. God closed the door. I'm almost to the end. God, God, Noah didn't close the door. God closed 
The door. Something that I believe us as fathers we are is we are the door. And there's three aspects to the door. One aspect of the door is the handle. The handle. Most doors have a handle that you either have to move the lever, turn the knob, or you'll push. But depending on the knob, it's hard to get a grip at times. It's hard for people to get a grip of us sometimes. It's hard for people to get a real grip of what we're dealing with or what's going on with us mentally, physically, spiritually, or emotionally. And they're trying to turn the knob, but sometimes we don't necessarily make it that easy. The other part of the door is the hinge. The hinge, this little flap that opens and closes, which lets you know which way the door will open. Either it's a push or a pull. Sometimes there's a reason why you can't get something out of us as men or as fathers is because you might need to pull, but you keep on pushing. If you would change your methodology, you might get a little bit more out of us. But it's understanding the hinge. Or do we need a push or do we need a pull? And once you figure it out, you'll eventually get a swinging door. But here's the other part of the door that often is a problem depending on what side you're on. It's called the hindrance, also known as a lock. And you need to have a key to open up the lock. And oftentimes, I know today you can buy a door, you get the handle and all of that, and it comes with two keys. Most of us men, we only come with one. And depending on what side of the door you're on, you feel safe or you're concerned. Well, Reggie, what does this door stuff have to do with anything? The door on the ark didn't have a hinge, didn't have a handle, and didn't have a lock. So how did it stay that way? That's another good question. You guys are good. When the ark was built, it was built with pitch within with, and without. The pitch is a form, it, it's a, a plaster that they put over to seal it. So he didn't need all of the extra stuff that we need because God is the one that opens the doors and God is the one that closes the doors. And the reason why we should be excited all the time about God being our father and we say, that's my daddy, is because even when life gets tough and you hit a hard place and you want to quit, you have to know the only reason why that thing got there is because God opened the door and said, you got it, you can take a look and keep on ticking. Don't worry about the problems, don't worry about the pain. If you don't give up and realize that I'm your daddy. I put in you what you need in order for you to endure whatever it is that you're going through. I put inside of you the stuff that has to come out of you. But if you want to be comfortable all the time, it'll never happen. I hope everyone in the room this morning brushed their teeth. If you didn't, raise your hand. <laughs> I wanted to see if I could catch somebody. He said, he said we did brush our teeth right, and I didn't. Did it. When you, when you get the tube of toothpaste, you can't talk to a real cute and say, come on out, toothpaste. Come on, you can do it. Come on out. Yeah, that's that nurturing stuff that everybody always wants. But the reality is, in order to get the toothpaste out, what do you have to do? Please. You got to apply pressure. And the more the stuff comes out and the less that's inside of there, the more pressure it takes to get it out. God says, I am the door, and if I let something come in, you've got what it takes to handle it and to deal with it. And when you get done, you do the exact same thing that David did. Give me the praise, the honor, and the glory. Because you didn't, you didn't believe it when you got in it. You, were, you barely were believing when you were going through it. But please don't forget when you come out of it. Please don't forget when you come out of it. Dads, I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult. Because looking at some of you in here, your dad is not here anymore. And you wish that you could call him up. Send him a text message. Look on your phone and see who's calling. And they say, Dad. And one thing that ran through my mind is this. We may not get our flowers while we're here, but don't be upset when we leave. Because when you had the opportunity, you didn't come to the door. You gave up on turning the knob. 
You didn't realize that all you had to do was pull the door, but you just kept on pushing. You had the key because you're mine, but you were too afraid to put it in and turn. There was a man who hit a hard place on Father's Day and he said, I don't want to be the guy that says, well, no, I, I am the guy that looked at my dad and would say, he's everything I want to be at age five. At age 10, I thought he might still be that strong. At age 16, nah, he can't still be that strong. At age 18, he can't know what he's talking about because things don't go that way anymore. At age 25, you still doing the same stuff, Dad? Stop it. At age 40, he said, man, I wish you were here. At age 55, he said, man, I wonder what dad would say about this. If you have your dad, find out what he'll say today. Because God forbid you miss out on being able to say what you need to say tomorrow. That's my dad. <laughs> so I'm going to pray with you, and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Aaron. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We may not understand you, but yes, you are a good, good father. We may not be able to get a full grip, but you always want us to keep trying. Thankfully, you are not an individual hand. You are a swinging door that you're always willing, ready, and able to do what we need, to, need, need, need you to do. You say come boldly before the throne of grace, but sometimes we kind of hold back. Sometimes we don't believe all the way on ourselves, but if we would stop for a minute and realize and remember that our Father is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who sits up high and looks down low, the one who has heaven as his throne and earth as his footstool. And we say, that's my daddy. We remember all things are possible because we are in you and you are in us. We thank you and we love you, God. And I pray that those who needed to hear what they needed to hear, they heard it. Those who needed to feel what they needed to feel, they felt it. And those who need to be touched by your grace and mercy, I pray you touch them from today and forevermore. For all of us are simply traveling through this world. We just pray that we get our flowers while we're here and not at the graveside. In the mighty name of Jesus, let all of us say, Amen.